Hello, everyone, and welcome back to this session of ECN 2021. I hope you've enjoyed the program both yesterday and this morning. We've had some fantastic speakers, and we will continue to have some great speakers as well. So my name is Nicole Gunter. I am the moderator of the Collections of the World Symposium. This is the second year that we've hosted this symposium, and if you missed last year's tours, don't worry, you can check them out on ECN's YouTube channel. And this session is also going to be recorded uh, for your viewing, and hopefully we'll post them a little bit quicker <laughs> than we did this past year. I want to thank you all for uh, joining us right now, um, and also a big thank you to not only the speakers, but everyone else who contributed to making these uh, collections tours videos. These tours are shorter than most of our other, other talks because we wanted to include a large number of collections uh, and allow for as many different tours of the world as possible. Each presentation uh, has been given a 15 minute block. So depending on the video length, uh, there will be a variable amount of time for questions and answer. Ideally, we would like to stick to the program as close as possible, um, but there may be a little bit of give. Um, unfortunately, the last talk of the, uh, the day had to be withdrawn due to unforeseen circumstances, so the session is going to end 15 minutes earlier than planned. But not to worry, there is an excellent meet and greet planned for 3 p.m. PST, uh, which is for digitization across the Latin American collections, as well as the show and tell. And that's uh, going to be bilingual in both Spanish and English. So it should be a great opportunity uh, there as well. Uh, many of the speakers here are here with us live today to answer questions and respond to the, the comments. So just a reminder, you guys have been doing really well so far, uh, but please direct all questions into the uh, question and answer filter uh, feature at the bottom. Uh, and not the chat, as this really helps us as, as the moderators to answer the questions and have an engaging uh, live Q&A session. The chat function is available mostly for technical problems and also conversing with the attendees. Remember that the default webinar chat uh, goes directly to the hosts and the panelists, but you can change it to everyone just using that little drop down menu there. Um, uh, please use the chat box carefully, judiciary. We will be removing any, uh, you know, you need to use appropriate use of the chat. If not, you may be removed from the meeting and the chat function disabled. As attendees of this virtual conference, ECN's code of conduct applies to all virtual events as well. So we're going to try and keep to time. So we've got a couple of minutes. I don't think that there are any other announcements, but I hope you all, for those that joined the virtual lunch, had a, had a great opportunity to meet and talk with some other people. So Chris, maybe if you want to share the sponsor slide for just a couple of seconds before we uh, get started.
So with that, our first uh, tour, we are traveling to Europe for a tour of the Natural History Museum of Denmark, which is located in Copenhagen. Um, we have to thank the, the team at the museum and Alexei Solodovnikov will be answering questions later. Hello, ACNers. Welcome at the Natural History Museum of Denmark. And today we are giving you a virtual tour in our Beetle collection. But when you think about Denmark, when you think about Copenhagen, of course, you also think about uh, great uh, Fabricius collection of insects in general, and also about the amber collection. So we took the opportunity of this tour to also mention a few words about that and for that I pass the word to my colleague and the curator of the Fabricius collection and Amber, Lars Wilhelmsen. Thank you Alexei. I'm the curator of Hymenoptera and a number of other insect orders here at the Natural History Museum of Copenhagen uh, and um, I'm also the curator of the Amber which I'm going to say a bit about uh, later. Uh, but first Fabricius, uh, I mean Fabricius was particularly active in the last third of the uh, 18th century, uh, that is, he was like a generation after Carl Linné. So uh, Fabricius was one of the first to really implement uh, Linné's system uh, of binomial uh, nomenclature for describing, uh, we think, about 10,000 species of insects. And here in this cabinet we have uh, some of the original literature, um, very old fragile books that, that I have to handle carefully but this this uh, th this work for instance contains the original descriptions of uh, Hymenoptera uh, that, that, that uh, Fabricius uh, work was doing his life and as you notice there are no pictures so uh, it's a good thing that we have the specimen still this makes it easier to figure out uh, exactly what Fabricius meant when he made these fairly brief descriptions in Latin but we have thousands of type specimens here. This is just an example, some, some bees. Uh, uh, but we have uh, everything uh, here in, in Copenhagen except for, for the Coleoptera, actually. Uh, the history of the collection is that it was originally two uh, collections, one belonging to Copenhagen and one belonging to Kiel, the University Museum in Kiel. And for many decades, uh, the, the Kiel collection was on uh, a long-term loan to, to uh, Copenhagen, uh, but this eventually came to an end. Uh, so a few years back, uh, we handed back part of the collect Fabricius collection, and instead of splitting type series right down uh, the, the Fabricius collection, it was decided to uh, return just the Coleoptera, but all of them, not just the, uh, the, 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 the Kiel part of the collection, but also the Copenhagen part. So all the Fabricius beetles are now in, in Kiel, in University Museum of Kiel. Uh, the other thing I'm going to talk uh, about is uh, the Amber collection. Uh, uh, we already had, uh, uh, until a few years ago, we already had a fairly large Amber collection, uh, 10,000 pieces of Amber with, with insect inclusions approximately. But, uh, uh, this, this was fairly old and uh, a few years ago we were uh, able to acquire uh, through generous donations from a number of foundations uh, we acquired a large um, private uh, amber collection uh, from, uh, from, from, from northern Jotland. In total this is more than 60,000 uh, pieces of amber and they take up a lot of space uh, basically all, all the uh, the cabinets to the right in this corridor is, is, is now filled up with amber specimens and, and we have more besides in different rooms. We are, we are still working on databasing. Uh, well, everything has been databased and repackaged, but we are still working on sorting and, and, uh, and identifying specimens in the amber collection. And this will occupy us for some years to come. Uh, the largest part of uh, the amber inclusions, of course, consists of diptera, which are especially likely to be caught, but we do have uh, representatives of many other orders of insects, including beetles. So if you are interested in uh, working with some amber material, please uh, contact us. All 
All right, uh, so serendipitously, if I made this word, word correctly, the Fabricius corner and amber corner of the collections in, in this uh, one part of the room, and the beetle collection is actually in the opposite part of the collections room. But we thought it would be great to give you this uh, space uh, orientation in our collection. So here, I'm starting to work towards the beetle collection and on my right hand we have cabinets with the smaller insect orders. On my left hand we have cabinets of Lepidoptera, which is also a very large uh, part of the insect uh, collection. So we have uh, Heteroptera here and in the past there was Neil Smeller Anderson, the curator of Heteroptera, so it's quite sizable collection as well. And here we have several cabinets of Diptera, and you of course know Thomas Pape, who curates the Diptera collection. And here it's still the Lepidoptera, so there's lots of butterflies. And finally, we arrived uh, to the spot where the Coleoptera collection begins. So this is the beginning of our beetle collection, which goes uh, to the end of, of, of that wall. So it's actually, in terms of uh, size, it's, it's, it's quite a lot. It's one-fourth of the cabinets. And here, again, after some Lepidoptera, we have the Hymenoptera collection, which is the also responsibility of Lars. So it's approximately, we like to say, two million specimens of beetles, but I'm not uh, actually quite sure how updated is this number. Plus we have wet collection of alcohol preserved specimens downstairs. So the collection consists of two parts. One part is a few cabinets of the Danish material. It's a very detailed collection of the Danish fauna and later Aslak, uh, uh, one of uh, our team members today will tell you about that. And then the rest, uh, these are cabinets of the global uh, collection. So it's Coleoptera of the world. And um, um, essentially, even though of course our collection is Palearctic biased, it's a global collection. And for different families, we may have different geographical or taxonomic strains. But generally, it's a glo global collection where all uh, uh, regions are represented. So now we are going traditionally uh, to the corner, like the traditional beginning of all beetle collections, which start with Adefaga and uh, Carabidi. And uh, Carabidi is a good example of our collections, which are really well curated. So here I'm uh, opening randomly uh, one of the cabinets just to give you a look how the collection is curated. So we have nice wooden uh, cabinets uh, with uh, wooden boxes with uh, unit trays, plastic, plastic unit trays organized in the usual uh, way. And uh, we also color code uh, the... Uh, origin of the material. And you can see, okay, it's uh, Nebria, so it's a uh, uh, temperate uh, holarctic group. So we have here Palearctic dominance and a bit of, uh, a bit of species from the Nearctic. So just another, okay, so this is again Nebria. So it's actually all Nebriini. So, and you see again, we have species from Palearctic and, and from Nearctic. So, so this is how, uh, how the well-organized part of the collection looks. Uh, the material is organized uh, alphabetically within subfamilies. Genera are organized alphabetically within uh, subfamilies and so on. Species alphabetically within the genera. And everything is marked externally on the cabinet. So it's a straightforward and easy to navigate collection. Unfortunately, not fully digitized. We have other uh, well-attended collections. Of course, uh, we are trying, working hard on Staphylinid collection. Traditionally, there is strong Hydrophilid collection because Michael Hansen was working here. But also, there are big parts of the Beetle collection which did not enjoy special curatorial uh, assistance. And that's why it's great to have students uh, or postdocs like Vinicius who works on, uh, on Lysidid. Hi. 
I didn't know you were filming here today. Uh, so, as Alexei was saying, uh, this collection is full of big surprises. In fact, I have just been here for a few months and I can, sh I can show to you the Lycity collection. And even though it's not as large as uh, we would expect from a collection like this to be, it is full of surprises, uh, mostly uh, with specimens from old collections in the old world, especially Africa and in the Palearctic region. But of course, uh, we're going to have material from all over the world, and not only for the Lycidae and the soft beetles, but many other groups of beetles out there. For I know that our audience really likes knowing what kind of beetles we have here for Tenebrionida, Corculionida, Cerambicoidia, etc. Um, and we hope that we can make a little quick tour so you can have a, a look and a peek at our drawers. Okay, so guys, so far you had a quick snapshot of the world collection of beetles, but uh, now Aslak will introduce you to our Danish collection. Hello. So one of the bigger parts of our collection is, of course, the Danish ones. And here we have a very well curated collection um, with many specimens from across Denmark. Um, one of the things we try to do with our Danish collections are faunistic records of different regions. Uh, and we've also made a reference collection, including a single specimen for each species. And these are actually slowly being digitized in the form of high resolution images uh, that are being put on the website called the Danish Beetle Bank, which is a, a online database where we try to gather the information of Danish beetles. Um, so what you've seen now so far um, is kind of the well curated part of the collection. But to achieve that, we need collection managers. So as you see here on top, there's still a lot of boxes left and the collections manager's task, one of them is to integrate these into the collection. Hello, I'm Sri Savantaran and I'm one of the collection managers here at the museum's entomological collection. Um, we are involved in all aspects of care and maintenance of the collection and we collaborate with the curators in management of the collection. Uh, a part of the routine collection duties um, like databasing, imaging uh, loans, we also train and supervise students and volunteers in the collection related tasks. Um, currently, we have a, a steady flow of students and volunteers who are pinning and mounting insects for us. Managing insect um, accession is also one of the main tasks that's been keeping us busy. We've been uh, receiving many accessions over the years. Um, one of them is the Ola Male collection, which is uh, a very beautifully uh, prepared Cerambicet collection. So I hope you enjoyed our short tour in the collection and again I emphasize the collection is alive when people are working with that. Not only our permanent staff but visitors, students, uh, whoever. You are all welcome in our collection. And now it's time to say goodbye. До свидания. This is. Jumba lagi. E ciao. <laughs>
but we are freezing everything. So every, every package, uh, everything new is coming to the collection before it goes inside uh, the collection is getting frozen. Plus there is also a regular check of the boxes. Like if there is a small trace of, um, you know, infestation, it gets immediately frozen. But we luckily, I knock the wood, uh, don't have this uh, problem at all. Uh, and maybe also because the the drawers are very good, they're very tight. And there is a follow-up question to that. What kind of freezers are you using? Are they chest, walk-in or upright? It's the, yeah, for this kind of freezing, it's a chest freezer, it's pretty big with a minus 20 Celsius. Does that freezing affect the plastic at all? Sorry? Does the freezing affect the plastic unit trays? No, no. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much. Fantastic video. And we're going to continue to move along with the program. You're welcome. Thank you. So next stop, we're heading over to the US where Craig Brabant will connect us with the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection, which is located at the University of Wisconsin. Here we are together on this beautiful blue orb. It looks pretty nice from up here despite everything that's going on down below. I'm Craig Braban. I'm the curator of the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection. Thanks for tuning in today for this virtual tour of the WIRC. We're located in the upper Midwest of the United States on the campus of the University of Wisconsin in Madison on the shore of beautiful Lake Mendota. This campus was built on the unceded land of the Ho-Chunk Nation. Before I share our wonderful collection with you, I'd like to tell you about a recent project to um, significantly improve and expand the capacity of our collection. So let's get started. Here's another view of our campus. Madison is the capital of the state of Wisconsin. The WRC is housed within the Department of Entomology, and our collection is actually split between two buildings, Russell Laboratories, and across the street and down the block a little ways, we also have space in the Stock Pavilion. We're on the third floor of both buildings. Russell Laboratories is a typical academic building. There are classrooms and laboratories for students, student labs on the first floor, and then researcher labs and offices on the upper floors. The Stock Pavilion is a beautiful historic building. Might not be the first choice when selecting space for a natural history collection, but we eagerly accepted the additional space when it was offered to us about 15 years ago. It's a multi-use facility. So here we have the UW Forestry Club, I believe, holding their annual Christmas tree and holiday wreath sale. Customers drive in one door and pick out their tree and the wreath and drive out the other door. We use the big central dirt floor as a staging area for our 
cabinets, which was great. I'd like to point out that there is no elevator here to, that reaches our collection space on the third floor. So everything in our collection space, all the specimens, all the natural history cabinets, minus 30 freezer, everything had to go up two flights of stairs. As we began our project, I looked for other opportunities to improve the space. I thought this would be a simple tile repair, but it led to this after asbestos was discovered in the tile and the adhesive and had to be remediated. We also discovered a noticeable leak on an outside wall that unfortunately got worse before it got better. But these building issues, the issues with the space, as well as the uh, replacement of all of our natural history cabinets were supported by a program on campus, the Research Core Revitalization Program. This was a pilot program that launched in 2020, and it was meant to give a one-time injection of support into research cores, which are unique campus facilities that offer resources to anyone across campus um, that might have difficulty getting funding in other ways. And after reading the description, it seemed like it would be a perfect fit. So I developed a budget and along with the director, submitted a proposal. And uh, fortunately we were successful. And I'll show you some of the before and after, um, which I think you'll agree resulted in a pretty dramatic change and improvement to our collection. Here we are looking at Russell Labs from in front of the stock pavilion. Let's go inside up to our collection space. <laughs> Despite its appearance, this is not a storeroom. This is the main collection space uh, in the stock pavilion for the WRC. This is actually where we house our Lepidoptera. And primarily because of the efforts of one of Dan's former students, we have been adding material, tremendous amounts of new specimens uh, over the last decade from Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. Uh, he's a really prolific collector of Lepidoptera, and he's added tens of thousands of specimens in that span. We've also added um, a, several large donations of specimens from other individuals, again, primarily of Lepidoptera. So this has resulted in us having more material than we could actually hold in our natural history cabinets. The file boxes contain our reprint library and those came over from Russell Labs to free up space over there. So we've had issues in terms of the ability to um, expand in both buildings but it's really more obvious here in the stock pavilion and that's why I'm kind of focusing on it today. Uh, so I just want to point out that this is how this space looked at the beginning of 2021. Um, now I'd like to take you through the collection space as it looks presently.
So what are the strengths of the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection? Like all natural history collections, our strengths are a reflection of the research interests and the passion of present and former staff and faculty here in the department, as well as the passion of those collectors who have donated their collections to us throughout the years. So I'm gonna take a little bit of time to highlight what I consider to be the strengths of our collection. It's no fluke that we have one of the best hoverfly collections in North America. Well, it is actually due to a fluke. It's due to Charles Fluke, former director who studied hoverflies. Um, because of his efforts, we, we have a really extensive collection of surfids from all around the world, um, well over a thousand species uh, represented of this family in our collection. Bill Hilsenhoff was an aquatic entomologist in our department and he and his students collected three quarters of a million specimens from um, just about every body of water in Wisconsin, ranging from the smallest mud puddle up to the Great Lakes. And his collection formed the basis of the uh, Hilsenhoff Aquatic Index, which is used to assess the health of freshwater streams and rivers and is still used today. Robert Dick uh, studied mosquitoes. We have a fairly extensive and comprehensive uh, mosquito collection um, with 14,000 pinned or point-mounted specimens and several thousand slides. Our director, as many of you probably know, is a coleopterist, and so it's no surprise probably that we have a really strong just general coleoptera um, collection. He currently has a student who is um, exploring the Lucanid diversity in China. So our Lucanid um, holdings are one of our strengths and, and is getting stronger by the moment. We recently received a donation of um, specimens from an individual who went to school here many years ago. He now lives in Texas, but he um, wanted to show some love to his alma mater and he collected extensively in Central and South America. Um, so we received over 80 drawers of material and about 60 of them uh, look like this. That is to say mixed Lepidoptera, um, really well curated and labeled. Um, what wasn't uh, Lepidoptera uh, turned out to be mostly beetles. Uh, probably again, no surprise, a lot of people like to collect scarabs. I don't know why, but but really nicely pinned and labeled material. He also um, appreciated uh, regivids and Koreids, and so we got some nice bugs to interpolate into our collection. Reality is that 12 minutes is not nearly enough time to tell you about all of the things that we have in our collection and all of the reasons why you should come and visit. Uh, we certainly do have space in our collection for visiting researchers and lots of material to go through. So I would encourage each and every one of you to reach out and contact us about um, the specimens in our collection or visiting us here in Madison. Uh, thanks for your time today. I hope you enjoyed this uh, small taste of the Wisconsin Insect Research Collection. Thank you very much. The production value of your tool was incredible. <laughs> um, so I'll wait for any questions in the chat, but just a quick one first. Uh, it was great to see the before and after of your rehousing. Were there any Thanks. hidden surprises or awesome specimens you came across during the complete move? Um, if I said yes, it would imply that I haven't been working in the collection enough. So. <laughs> Actually, I, I knew what was there. It's just a matter of housing it. And 
I'm always embarrassed to admit, but I didn't um, even show you Russell Laboratories, which has, you know, the other three big orders and also got uh, complete replacement of the natural history collection cabinet. So not any real surprises. It, it, it's been nice to be able to go through all of the drawers though. And any tips for people that may be uh, doing a similar revamp of their collections? What's the number one lesson learned? Um, try to avoid doing it during a global pandemic. Um, no, you know, I put together a different talk and I think one of the biggest keys for me was to measure multiple times in order once. So we were constrained because of the limitations in our building. Um, we have a freight elevator in Russell Labs that goes from the first floor to the basement, uh, not up to the third floor. So we actually had to choose cabinets based on ones that would actually fit in the, the person elevator. So um, be ready for unexpected expenses and just uh, think about all the different all the different steps for sure. I can t I can give you a whole list of things to. <laughs> So avoid if, if possible, now looking back in hindsight. Excellent, well, thank you very much, Craig. So next up, we are going to head north across the border for the third country of our Collections of the World tour. This time, the team at the Canadian Museum of Nature in Ottawa will show you their entomology collection. Hello, my name is Andrew Smith, and I'm an entomologist at the Canadian Museum of Nature. The other entomologists on staff at the museum are Francois Genier, who is the collection manager of entomology, and Bob Anderson, a research scientist. What you are seeing here is the Natural Heritage Campus of the Museum of Nature, located in beautiful Gatineau, Quebec. Gatineau is just across the river from Ottawa, where the main public display building of the museum is located. The Natural Heritage Campus is where you will find all of the research and collections facilities, including the entomology collection. Other collections include the rest of zoology, botany, geology, and paleontology. We have strong collections-based research programs in worldwide species discovery and the Arctic. Let's go inside and meet Francois. Oh, hi. My name is François Genier. I have been the insect collection manager here at the museum since September 1990. Bob Anderson, our research entomologist, was hired just a few months before me as the first full-time permanent employee of the newly established entomology section. Before 1990, the only extensive insect collection and associated systematic research in Ottawa was at Agriculture Canada, which deals with the administration of the Canadian National Collection of Insects, which is not to be confused with the collection of the Canadian Museum of Nature. Both are in the National Capital Region, but the CNC collection is physically located in Ottawa and the Canadian Museum of Nature collection is located in a modern facility in Gatineau where temperature and humidity are precisely controlled. We have been in our current location since 1998. Our collection grew from just a few thousand specimens in 1990 to over 1.2 million specimens today. The focus of the collection, Coleoptera, is in line with Henry and Anne Howden's research interests, scarabs and weevils. The early core of the collection consisted of their collection, which was acquired over a period of 20 years. In parallel, we have also received several major donations and our strength has grown in other family of beetle as well. Today, we have extremely good representation for tiger beetle, carrion beetles, scarab beetles, longhorn beetles, and weevils. Our major contributors are the Howdens and Stuart and Yarmila Peck. 
So as Francois mentioned, we have world-class holdings in two groups of beetles in particular, scarabs and weevils. The scarab collection, you can see here, is probably one of the top five in the world, with perhaps the largest and most comprehensive collection of neotropical scarabs in the world. In total, we have over 300,000 scarab specimens in this collection, with excellent representation from all geographic areas across the world. The Weevil Collection is equally impressive compared to other museums around the world. All groups of weevils are well re represented in the collection with significant holdings from all major geographical regions. The most remarkable aspect of the Weevil Collection is our holdings in neotropical leaf litter weevils which Bob Anderson has spent his career building. In total, we have at least 300,000 specimens of weevils, probably much more than that because Bob continues to collect at a rapid pace. Hi there, my name is Bob Anderson. I'm a, an entomologist here at the Canadian Museum of Nature specializing in the study of weevils. Um, as has been previously mentioned, we have around 300,000 specimens of weevils here at the museum. Um, most of those are from the Americas, however we do have strengths in other parts of the world, particularly Australia uh, and uh, African material as well. Um, my interests have been in uh, studying leaf litter weevils, as, as Andrew previously mentioned, and I've traveled over the Americas trying to collect every single leaf, leaf litter weevil in existence and have it represented here in the museum collection. I'm part way there, but I still have lots to go. So. I wanted to show you a few strengths of our weevil collection today. I wanted to show you some material we've collected in Cuba here. We've been fortunate over the last few years to be able to uh, uh, carry out some field work in Cuba. So we have some nice holdings here of Cuban weevils, probably one of the better collections around of those. And whenever I started here at the museum, uh, we had received a, a large donation from Henry and Ann Howden as well. And another strength of our collection is Anne's Broadnose Weevil Collection. Anne spent a lot of time working on Broadnose Weevils and became one of the world experts and the world experts in the Tani Mesonine Weevils. And we have quite a strong collection of those. We also have other good collections from uh, the Philippines as well, acquired recently. And we're continuing to develop in all ways with uh, respect to the weevils. Weevils are one of the most uh, diverse groups of, of insects. and. Uh, we're trying to continue to develop the collection. We're, uh, we like to emphasize that the strengths of the collection are not only the diversity we have here, the material has all been collected relatively recently, comes with really good data with, uh, with uh, information on latitude, longitude, habitat information, often host plant information if they're collected on particular plants. However, the scarabs and weevils should not overshadow other aspects of this collection. For example, the family Lyotidae, or small carrion beetles. We have 180 drawers of Lyotids in this collection, which has to be one of the largest collections in the world. Most of this material came from Stuart Peck, who does research on this family. This entire aisle here consists of dung beetles. Dung beetles were uh, Henry's uh, favorite group, and this is also the focus of my research. Just follow me again here. And there's another aisle of dung beetles. And the Melolanthine collection is also one of the largest in the world. If you look at this entire bank here, it is entirely Melolanthines. And that's great for me because this is the primary focus of my taxonomic research. And we also have a very large and impressive Aphodiine collection. And thanks to Paul Skelly, who did much of the curation and, and identification of this group. Here at the Canadian Museum of Nature, we have over 1,000 holotypes stored in a separate cabinet. and. Uh, we are in the process of digitizing all the data and uh, taking pictures for each of the specimen that we will eventually offer online. And this is an example of one of our special collections. 
This entire cabinet consists of beetles from the Galapagos Islands. And most of this material was collected by Stuart Peck. Here we have one of our most recent acquisition. Uh, this is a wonderful collection of beetle and uh, it was given to us by uh, Rod Parrott, who was an amateur entomologist here in Canada. He was mostly interested in the most beautiful and colorful species of uh, beetles and also uh, bird wing butterflies. So I can show you a bit of the bird wing butterflies just after this. This is an example of a drawer of the bird wing collection of uh, Rod Parrot. They are just magnificent. There is also a good selection of uh, morpho butterfly in the same collection. Welcome to the National Biodiversity Cryobank of Canada, which is part of the Canadian Museum of Nature. The cryobank opened in 2018 with the purpose of providing state-of-the-art storage facilities for DNA and tissue used for research. The liquid nitrogen freezers that you see here can provide long-term storage at minus 170 degrees Celsius for up to 200,000 specimens. We are currently working on a project to incorporate over 6,000 DNA quality scarab samples to the cryobank collection. This material, this is material that I had collected and accumulated for research over the past 20 years. All of the scarabs should be incorporated by the end of next year. Then, the database of holdings will be available for researchers from around the world to search and request tissue samples for their own research projects studying the taxonomy and phylogenetics of scarabs. Thanks to a generous donation from Stuart and Yarmila Peck, the entomology collection at the Canadian Museum of Nature has its own dedicated Visiting Scientist Award program. The annual, annual travel grants are awarded to facilitate research in the study of beetle systematics and fossil insects using the standard and fossil insect collections here at the museum. If you have a research project that involves using the Canadian Museum of Nature collection, or if you would like to provide your expertise to enhance the state of curation of our collection, please consider applying for this award to cover your travel expenses. The deadline for applications is March 31st annually, and the details are available on the Canadian Museum of Nature website. Thank you. So no I was, was make fun. great tour. Love to see Paul there behind the Aphodium cabinet. And for those that don't know, Paul's giant poster often attends our solar scarab meeting workshops too. It's been around the continent a couple of times, yes. <laughs> so I'll just wait for any question and answers in the chat, but I'll ask you, can, perhaps can you start talking a little bit more about the new Visiting uh, Scientist Award? Any additional yeah, well, details you'd like to give? Oh, well, for sure. We've actually had one for a few years and uh, many beetle researchers have come up to the Museum of Nature and have worked in the collection and it's been great. I mean, we've not only got a lot of curation work done in the collection and identification work, but we've also collaborated with several people on some really good research projects. So. It's a, it's a really good program, and thanks to Stuart and Yarmila Peck making a big donation recently, this is a permanent thing uh, specifically for the entomology collection. So it's, uh, it's something where we, we should be able to have several visitors come up every single year as part of this program and get their travel expenses paid for, and they can spend, you know, a couple of weeks or however long it takes up here working on the collection and working with us on research. So we're, we're really excited to have this program and uh, you know, a heartfelt thanks to the PECs for 
recognizing that this is an important aspect of what we do at the museum and providing funding for it. Can you clarify if that's open to students and everyone at any career stage? It's, ab it, it's open to absolutely anyone. Yeah, I mean, there's an application process and uh, there, there will be a committee that looks at all the applications and I think they'll may be making selections based on, you know, what will have the best bang for the buck for the collection and the research, but otherwise, absolutely anyone can apply. Cool, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A box. Is there a benefit to that vertical uh, Lepidoptera storage? Is it... Um, just a traditional thing for your institution or just that one donation? Uh, that is a raw donation. So that's how they came from Rod Parrott's collection. Um, I, I think we'll probably be changing that, putting them into you know, modern tight ceiling drawers. Um, but yeah, that's something that just hasn't been done yet. It was donated about over a year ago, but because of the pandemic, it's just kind of sat there in stasis until we can get back in there and get cracking it, getting it uh, curated into the collection. And one final question for the non coleopterists in the audience. What other holdings other than the Beatles does the museum have? Um, there's not a lot. It's, it's primarily a Beatle collection. We do have a small collection uh, uh, of national capital region beetles uh, and other insects, which you know includes all other groups. And we have a smattering of other things, uh, you know, in a few drawers. But if you're looking for beetles, come to us and, and also go to the CNC uh, across the river. If you're looking for other insect groups, you probably want to go to the Canadian National Collection, the CNC. They uh, have all entomology covered there. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Andrew. My pleasure. So now to South America, the first of two tours from Brazilian collections. This next video doesn't have sound, so if the audio isn't working, that's the intended uh, way, but it gives us a very informative tour of the Father J.S. Mohi Entomological Collection located at Universidad Federal do Parana in Brazil. Thank you.
we have uh, Professor John Lutchke here um, to answer some questions if anyone has them in the chat, but I just want to comment incredible collection, 7 million specimens and two million of them, over 2 million of them uh, in wet, wet collections. I can only imagine the challenges to move into the new building. Can you talk about your current facilities and what you hope for the future? Well, uh, our current facilities are located on the third floor of uh, the General Biological Sciences Building. And uh, uh, the dry collection is divided into two parts, this Lepidoptera and the general collection. And uh, we have sort of like our, our standard uh, UFPR uh, drawers, which is sort of like, like the, the Cornell type things, but it's our Brazilian, our Brazilian models. And uh, it has climate control and, uh, and uh, we have um, security, electronic panels, uh, keyboards to get inside the collection. And uh, the, the life of our collection is really our graduate program. So, uh, you know, um, we have one of the largest graduate entomology graduate schools in the country. And, uh, and they're, they're the life of our collection. They're the students that are going inside, using it. And of course, the, the staff here on our university with their research projects depositing things here. So we're very proud of, uh, of the bee collection, which is, of course, thanks to the efforts of Dr. Paolo Mori and, and Professora D'Annunzia. And uh, but the Lepidoptera collection is also quite big. And, uh, but there's some up and coming collections now. The ant collection is growing and, uh, and with Renato Machado here, the Neuroptera collection should, should be growing also. That's absolutely incredible to hear about the graduate program and all of the impact uh, that the students have had. One of the questions in the chat is, does the digitization of the collection process, is that automated or is it entirely manual? It's manual, yes. And uh, yeah, uh -huh. and the, the pandemic sort of yeah, put a, a stop to, to some of that work because yeah, um, most people were, were at home. But uh, yes, for, for the while being, it is manual. A lot of it depends on, on student uh, assistantships. So depending on the amount of students that we have involved in, in the digitization, you know, it, the, the flow has its ups and downs. But there is uh, over 300,000 uh, um, records now that have been digitized and they can be accessed on the speciesLink.net. That's in incredible to hear. Um, are you focusing, I noticed in the video there were thousands of types uh, are uh, they prioritization for your digitization project? What's the status of them? Um, yeah, the the types definitely, but uh, we're, um, we're we're sort of like in in, in a flow now of, of trying to, to organize some some of our workflow. It uh, it depends a little bit also on 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 the funding and and like you know who gets some of the funding. But definitely the the types are are part of the uh, priority. Perfect. I think everyone is blown away with the incredible size of the collection and all of the effort that you've done. Are you excited in looking to looking forward into moving into the new museum space? Yes, we are. <laughs> Very much so because it's being designed specifically for housing natural history collections. So, uh, and yeah, we, we really are. It's, uh, the project is, is, uh, looks very promising. The, the, the land has been purchased already and uh, we're getting lots of support from City Hall, from, from the local uh, states, uh, govern, uh, government. So uh, yeah, we're keeping our, our hopes up high. Is it nearby to your current location or is it a little bit further away? Fortunately, it's nearby. It's located in the botanical gardens of the city, and uh, it's uh, well walking. That a bike ride should should be able to get us there in, in a jiffy. And I'm sure a few of us will be very interested to know that when you're planning that collections move, will the uh, loans and all of the still be available to be processed, or will you be, you be partially closing the collection short term? Uh, we will be uh, collecting. A, shutting down the collection for a while, but we, we, we we'll still haven't, you know, we're still just starting to sort of think what, how we're going to make this move because it's, it's a major deal. So, uh, 
details, I, I can't offer any details on that right now. But uh, it, uh, yeah, it's it's coming. But first, we want to see the building. You know, is the yeah, so at least you know the wall start to to lift up into the sky. Well, we're very excited for your future. So thank you so much for that collections tour. So next, we very are stay <laughs> staying in Brazil, and we'll now tour the laboratory de Coleoptera at Museo de Zoológica at the University de São Paulo. Turns out I need to practice my pronunciation. <laughs> Thank you. Olá a todos. Este é o Museu de Zoologia da Universidade de São Paulo. Meu nome é Thiago Polizei, eu sou aluno de doutorado e vou levar vocês pelo um tour pelo nosso museu. O Museu de Zoologia está localizado no bairro do Ipiranga, na cidade de São Paulo, bairro caracterizado por seu local de independência no Brasil há aproximadamente 200 anos. O museu e suas coleções tiveram início no Brasil do século XIX, na Era Imperial, onde foram realizados estudos sistemáticos em busca de recursos naturais e também para subsidiar a ocupação do território nacional. Os exemplares coletados durante essas expedições, tão bem quanto coleções particulares, foram doados ao governo do estado de São Paulo e dessa forma formaram a seção de zoologia do Museu Paulista, que ocupava inicialmente uma das torres do prédio monumento. Com um o aumento exponencial da coleção zoológica do Museu Paulista, em 1939 se deram início as obras para a construção do Museu de Zoologia só em 1941 ficou pronto, então toda a coleção de zoologia foi destinada a esse novo prédio. No segundo andar do prédio está localizada a coleção de entomologia, sendo que a coleção de coleóptero ocupa quase metade de todo esse setor. A coleção de coleóptero está distribuída ao longo de três salas, em armários compactadores e pelo corredor principal em armários de aço. Estima-se que a coleção de besouros compreenda aproximadamente um milhão de espécimes identificados a nível de família. Todos estão montados, organizados em caixas de madeira com caixinhas de papel. Nossa coleção é constituída principalmente de material da fauna brasileira, coletados em todas as regiões do nosso país e em todos os biomas do território nacional mas também temos um número considerado de espécimes coletados em outros países da América do Sul, especialmente os nossos vizinhos. Nosso acervo é constituído por representantes de todas as famílias de coleóptera que ocorrem no Brasil, e além de outras famílias que foram adquiridas graças ao intercâmbio com museus internacionais. Uhum. Grande parte do acervo de besouros da coleção do museu foi adquirida através da aquisição de coleções particulares formada por pesquisadores brasileiros ao longo do século XX. Entre as principais coleções incorporadas ao acervo do Museu de Zoologia, temos a coleção de Bockerman, Melzer, Malkin, Elias, Halleck e Bugmeier. Dentre as coleções obtidas pelo museu, a mais importante é de Richard von Dirishoffen, com cerca de 61 mil exemplares identificados e montados e outras centenas de milhares de exemplares ainda para se montar. Todo esse material era proveniente de todas as regiões do Brasil. Além disso, dentro da coleção Dirings, tinha outras coleções importantes que foram compradas por ele, como a de Nick, Geren, Bequiné e Flitzpaul. Graças ao contato que Dirings tinha com pesquisadores de todo o mundo, ele conseguiu montar uma coleção de referência, um material identificado pelos maiores especialistas em cada grupo de coleóptera. As coleções do Museu de Zoologia que foram formadas ao longo do século XX incluem material de todas as regiões do Brasil e de diversas localidades da América do Sul, muitas delas que já foram destruídas com o tempo. Dessa forma, o nosso acervo tem um importante registro histórico da fauna brasileira e neotropical. A coleção de coleóptera conta com mais de 2.300 tipos primários. Esse material é oriundo tanto das coleções adquiridas, quanto de pesquisadores e curadores que trabalharam aqui nas últimas décadas. Esses curadores tiveram grande importância para a formação, crescimento e enriquecimento da coleção do acervo do Museu de Zoologia, através da coleta, identificação, intercâmbio de material e publicação de vários trabalhos taxonômicos e sistemáticos. 
Dentre esses pesquisadores, podemos citar alguns importantes nomes, como os de Hans Richard, que nos anos 1970 trabalhou aqui no Museu de Zoologia e graças a ele temos uma das maiores e mais importantes coleções das famílias Hydroscaphid, Torrenticolid e Carabid Neotropical. Outro importante pesquisador foi o professor Ubirajara Martins, que durante seis décadas trabalhou com a fauna de cerambicídio aqui no Museu de Zoologia. Durante sua carreira, o professor Ubirajara publicou mais de 450 trabalhos, dentre eles a importante série de livros de cerambicídeos sul-americanos. Através desses trabalhos, ele formou a maior coleção de cerambicídeo neotropical, com mais de 300 mil exemplares depositados no acervo do museu. Outros dois importantes nomes de curadores da coleção de coleóptero são do professor Sérgio Antônio Vanin, que trabalhou nos últimos anos com a coleção de Curcolionide e Torrente College, e da professora Cleide Costa, pesquisadora sênior que ainda atua trabalhando no Museu de Zoologia e é especialista em lateroide. Ambos, tanto o professor Vanin quanto a professora Cleide Costa, foram os responsáveis pela formação da coleção de coleópteros imaturos, em 1966. Atualmente, a coleção de coleópteros imaturos conta com 40 mil exemplares, destes 18 mil larvas e 3.200 pulgas. Ela é caracterizada por ser principalmente fornecida de materiais que foram criados em laboratório e ainda está em constante crescimento. Como principal resultado dos trabalhos feitos pela professora Cleide Costa e seus colaboradores, temos a produção do livro Larvas de Coleóptero do Brasil, publicado em 1988. As coleções do Museu de Zoologia estão em constante crescimento, tanto devido ao trabalho e esforço de alunos e pesquisadores do Museu de Zoologia, como de outros pesquisadores do Brasil que depositam material na instituição. Mas, além disso, o museu é caracterizado pelo depósito de material testemunho, principalmente de projetos de impacto ambiental, como este trabalho no qual estamos fazendo a curadoria de centenas de milhares de exemplares coletados em cavernas do bioma Mata Atlântica e Amazônia do Brasil. Atualmente, o Laboratório de Coleóptero é constituído pela professora curadora Sônia Casari, uma pesquisadora sênior, quatro pesquisadores associados, sete alunos de pós-graduação, um pesquisador voluntário e um técnico. Apesar de cada aluno trabalhar com uma diferente família de coleóptero, tanto de ambientes aquáticos quanto terrestres, todos ainda mantêm a tradição dos estudos dos imaturos de besouro. Por ser uma unidade da Universidade de São Paulo, o Museu de Zoologia possui seus próprios programas de pós-graduação em Sistemática, Taxonomia Animal e Biodiversidade e em Museologia. Grande parte dos professores são também os curadores das coleções, o que faz que seus alunos adquirem uma sólida experiência tanto em acervo quanto na curadoria do material. As coleções do Museu de Zoologia compreendem uma das mais importantes e organizadas coleções do Brasil. Grande parte do acervo já encontra-se tombado na plataforma Specify e o número de material implementado na plataforma tem aumentado a cada ano. A coleção de coleóptero conta com uma enorme quantidade de exemplares ainda sem identificação e uma grande quantidade de espécimes apenas identificados a nível de família. Por isso nós contamos com a colaboração de pesquisadores nacionais e internacionais que queiram nos visitar e colaborar na correta identificação dos exemplares. Se caso você esteja procurando por uma determinada espécie ou família de besouro e você não encontrar no nosso acervo, basta você procurar na nossa coleção de miscelânea ou entrar em contato conosco. O Museu de Zoologia está sempre disposto a ajudar na sua pesquisa, seja com o envio de material ou recebendo visitantes internacionais e nacionais. Além disso, também podemos fornecer fotos dos tipos primários ou de qualquer outro material de nosso acervo. Se você procura por informações, fotos ou material para a sua pesquisa, entre em contato conosco, teremos o maior prazer em ajudar. Ou melhor, venha nos visitar. Para maiores informações sobre o Museu de Zoologia, coleção de coleóptera ou os programas de pós-graduação, entre em contato através do site. Muito obrigado. Até breve.
I'm blown away with that presentation. And we have Gabrielle Biffi uh, joining us to answer any questions. I think that there is a lot of us probably curious about the Immature collection. Is there any special considerations that you have for collections management or keeping keeping that so well maintained? Yeah, yeah, it's a world class collection. And the most special thing about this collection is that they are formed from reared specimens. So we have the, the correct uh, identification from adults and larvae. So it's the, it's the main thing about it. And well, currently it's displayed in, I think six or seven huge uh, steel cabinets in plastic bottles and full of vials. It, it's a bit annoying to to search in the collection because it's not e as easy as a dry collection, but it's well organized. There's a, a database, data bank for every specimen in the collection. And I, I don't have the numbers right now, but everything is uh, in the catalog. I, I have to say, I've never seen such a large immature collection. So something to be very pr proud of. And then, yeah, thanks to, to Dr. Clay de Costa, who had this project many years ago. So it's a proud for our collection. I also noted that you have an extremely interesting history of stuff and other collectors and collections. Is there any uh, particularly interesting specimen or story you'd like to tell about your favorite uh, part of the collection? Uh. Well, I, I think the most, uh, we don't have so many ancient uh, specimens because the, the work of collections started in the mid uh, of 19th century. So not so old collection, but we have uh, important parts that came with other collectors. Uh, especially particular uh, private collectors. So uh, their collections also have specimens that they exchanged with uh, world experts. So we have material from the world that came through these private collections. And I see a comment in the chat that seems like a great place to uh, study a master. What's your... Um, graduate student program like? Well, the, the you, you mean the graduate student? Sorry, I, I don't see yeah. the, the question here. The uh, graduate student program, do you have many students that work in the collection? Yeah, um, this is a, it's a program on zoology and systematics. So nearly everybody work on uh, museum specimens. So it's a systematic, uh, systematic and taxonomy and deeply grounded on collections. So everybody learns a little bit of managing and curation and collecting and everything. There are many students from master and PhD uh, levels and the, the new enrollment is open. So if anyone is interested, just check it out in the museum web page. Well, thank you very much. Fascinating tour. I think everyone at ECN has been thrilled to see behind the scenes of all of these collections so far. And with that- Thank you again for the invitation. <laughs> no problems. Uh, with that, we're gonna take a very short break that's scheduled right now. And we will be back on the 30 minutes of whatever time zone you're in. Welcome back and thank you for sticking around with us as the day proceeds. Next up, we are treated to a tour of the entomological collection of the Tecnologico de Anti Antioquia, located in Medellin, Colombia. Hello everyone, my name is Susmiriam Gomez and I am part of the Colección Entomológica Tecnológico de Antioquia. And uh, first of all, I want to thanks to the organizers of the event 
and the symposium. I want to share with you information about uh, our spaces and activities. The Colección Entomológica Tecnológico de Antioquia belongs to a public university institution located in Colombia, Northwest Medellin. It was established to store and deposit specimens collected in the field work from forensic entomological projects of Bioforensic Research Group. In 2013, the Colección Entomológica obtains the National Register of Biological Collections. Also, we have permission from national environmental authorities to study biological diversity and access to genetic resources. We aim to contribute to the biological diversity study in the neotropical region and the development of the application of forensic entomology as well. Our specimens are not just a physical element. From there, the information is derived that contributes to the knowledge of the biodiversity of taxonomic groups. For example, we have DNA sequences, morphometric information, evolutionary analysis, descriptions of new species, uh, covering all the extensions of an extended specimen. We don't have a large physical space, but we take care of a specimen from all the biogeographical regions of our country, from anthropocyte environmental uh, environments to pristine Amazonian and Chaco rainforest. Most samples were collected using bansomeridon traps bited by with viscera and chicken, cold liver and fish head in the composition. The specimens from the Andean region were collected monthly, monthly over three years. We have approximately um, 89,000 specimens on which 37% have been able to determine to species level. We have an adequate facility to, uh, that allow us to hold approximately 124 boxes under controlled environmental conditions and their DNA samples. We manage all the information that and biological records in a specified software. We house a specimen spined or preserved in alcohol. This is the space for molecular work. Here we carry out uh, extraction and amplification of DNA. After we send the samples to a sequencing company. The sequences are submitted to the NCBI and both systems. Now we are starting to use the medium for sequencing. We also are consolidating a collection of DNA on FTD cards. This is the space uh, where tutorial work is done and photographs of the specimens are taken. It is expected that at the end of the year, we have a larger space for this activity. Here we see Jessica Durango, who is our general curator. California is where the identification process is most advanced. In Sarcophagide, we have three described new species for the genus Oxysarcodexia, and still more species remain undescribed, as well as in New City. All processor material is being sent to the biodiversity system information in Colombia and the JV platform. 
Jessica Durango, the collection general the collection general curator, began her process as a student, and for more than ten years she has focused her work on family identification and describing seven new species. She expects to find more new taxa. In the collection, we have um, seven holotypes. The specialist of California, Dr. Eduardo Matt, is part of our work team. Here, we see him doing his job. <laughs> Lately, uh, he was been focusing on a new and interesting subject that promised outstanding scientific contributions by integrating forensic entomology and road ecology. In addition to the taxonomic identification process, species distribution maps have been generated and ecologic niche modeling has been made also. Uh, geometric morphometry has been explored as a species identification tool. We can see how we store here <laughs> the wings uh, for morphometric studies. It's here. As students and young professionals are linked to the entomological collection to support activities such as mounting samples and digitalization as part of their formative processes. A guide has been published with illustrates activities such as a specimen collection, DNA extraction to facilitate the performance of team members. The Colección Entomológica also supports undergraduate and master academic programs. The processing of an entomological sample is taught, including field work, collection, storage, preservation, identification, and forensic analysis. It is also a space for a study for the students to develop their degree projects. Research mainly from Brazil has visited us and we have exchanged training processes and entomological material. Our next goal is to make information available through remote access and develop 3D models as educative and taxonomic tools. And finally, I want to thank to the Tecnológico de Antioquia for the institutional support, to the Ministry of Science and Technology of Colombia for project fundings, and to Javid for the support through Bit Caribbean Call. And finally, it's an invitation for you to establish network networks, work networks. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. Mm, here, there are our contacts um, and we hope you come to visit us. Another fascinating collection and really great that you could join us today, Liz Marianne. Um, I just have to say that I love the fact that when you're working with so many forensic insects that you have a focus on the extended specimen. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? You're uh, muted. Yes, no, um, we can say, uh, I, I can say that uh, we teach to the students to process all the specimens from, from a, 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 a case. And they solve, um, and they say, I, they calculate EPM, that is the time of the death. And if the samples are um, relocated, 
Um, this is the focus of our collection, uh, forensic flies. But also we have another orders bar in few in few quantity. <laughs> I don't know why. Do I don't. <laughs> the other forensic insects you have, uh, do you have large holdings of beetles? Um, beetles, beetles, only beetles, and maybe even optera. But uh, there are no, uh, a lot, a lot of specimens. But flies are so critical, uh, yeah. so I'm sure it's such a incredibly valuable resource, not only to the systematics community, uh, but just to society. Are, are you involved in many, um, so like forensic cases, supporting them with the evidence you have? Uh, we are focused on research, but uh, the authorities uh, of our region uh, sometimes uh, ask for a favor to, to identify some uh, specimen from cases, uh, but only when are um, important cases for the, for the, I don't know, for the maybe uh, important people, <laughs> or, uh, but we are not dedicated to that because we have not enough uh, persons to make this. So mostly a very useful research collection. Uh, so there's a question in the chat. Do you have a favorite sampling site in Colombia or a particular habitat? Particular what? Habitat or a sampling site, favorite sampling site. I don't understand. <laughs> Are you right? Uh, so in the question and answer box. I, I want to see. Do you have a favorite sampling site? Okay. Um, no, uh, but I know that um, it's interesting uh, to sample in biogeographic Choco and Amazon because there are no enough information about these kind of regions, but we have no unfavorite <laughs> place. Uh, in the next month, we are going to planning a, 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 a field work for um, collect more samples for our collection in high, um, high, alt, uh, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Elevation or altitude. Problem. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Liz. I'm sure that there are many dipterists who are thrilled to hear about your collection okay. uh, and the rest of us as well. Very cool. Thank you. I'm sorry by, by my English. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was great. Thank you. So next up, we are heading back to the United States, where we'll feature some of the oldest collections in the country. First, Crystal Mayer will start us with the collection as, uh, in the, Compar the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard U University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Hello. Thanks to the organizers and speakers for putting together such a great conference so far. They've really done a fantastic job of continuing these virtual meetings, though I can't wait to see you all again in person. So today I'm going to give you a tour of the entomology collection at the Museum of Comparative Zoology at Harvard. So I'm Crystal Meyer. I'm the curatorial associate at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. And on staff, we have two faculty curators, Professor Brian Farrell and Professor Nomi Pierce, who run research labs focused on Coleoptera and Lepidoptera, respectively. There are also two curatorial assistants, Rachel Hawkins and Whit Farnham, who handle imaging requests, loans, and recuration in the collection. This collection would not be what it would be what it is today without the tireless efforts of them and their predecessors. The Museum of Comparative Zoology is located on the campus of Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. And we're actually really lucky in a way. We're one of the few collections at the MCZ that's still housed in the old Museum of Comparative Zoology building. This is both a blessing and a curse as I get to walk through this amazing hall every day on my way to the office. Of course, this means we have to deal with all sorts of nuisances 
of being in an old building, including pests, poor climate control, poor ventilation, which became extremely important during the pandemic, and some serious space limitations. Behind these doors, we house nearly 800 cabinets containing over 8 million insect specimens from all over the world. We also have specimens in ethanol, ones that are slide mounted, and a significant fossil collection as well. While we're certainly not the largest entomological collection, we're one of the oldest in North America. And with over 35,000 primary types, we're also one of the most type dense collections in the US and perhaps the world. These specimens are widely used by the community for ta taxonomic studies, but their value goes beyond that of descriptive work. Many of these specimens date back to the late 18th and 19th centuries, and the sheer age of these specimens provides us with a window back in time to North America at the outset of European colonization, allowing us to make inferences about the distribution of species and functioning of ecosystems prior to heavy habitat modification by the Europeans. Given this amazing density of historical and taxonomically important material, it's worth examining the early history of entomology in the US and looking for links to the MCZ. The history of entomology at Harvard actually predates the establishment of the MCZ in 1859 by Louis Agassiz. A quick look at the who's who of early entomologists in the US reveals that the collections of many of these first entomologists uh, are actually housed at Harvard. And some of these early entomologists actually worked here and trained here. For example, William Dendridge Peck was one of the first US-born entomologists. He led quite a varied life, trained as a physician, then moved to a farm in Maine, where he remained and became somewhat of a naturalist. Quite fortuitously, his interest in natural history came from his discovery of a copy of Systema Naturae in the remnants of a shipwreck. He continued his work in entomology, particularly in the entomology of economically important insects. Then he was appointed professor of natural history at Harvard, and his specimens remain in the collection at the MCZ today, although they're scattered throughout the collection. One of his trainees, Thaddeus Harris, was another of the earliest entomologists in the US. He was not a professional entomologist, but he was trained as a physician and found his place as librarian and lecturer at Harvard. His work in economic entomology is particularly well known. The Harris collection, oddly, did not remain at Harvard after his death. It was donated to the Boston Society of Natural History, though it was transferred back to Harvard and to the MCC in the first half of the 20th century. This collection remains the oldest intact insect collection in the United States and contains all of Harris's types, as well as specimens from the infamous Say collection. Thomas Say is considered by many to be the father of descriptive taxonomy in the United States. He described over a thousand new species of beetles and helped found the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia. And he was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. As I mentioned earlier, he examined much of Harris's material and included them in his collection. Unfortunately, what remains of this historically important collection is now nearly destroyed. Upon his death, the collection was shipped to Harris by way of New Orleans. When they arrived at Harvard, they were found to be in terrible condition. They were pest ridden and in pieces. In a letter to a colleague, Harris wrote, I assure you that Mr. Say's cabinet does not contain one half of the species that he described. And of the insects in it, many are without names and all are more or less mutilated and so badly preserved that some of them are now absolutely worthless. They have, however, proven not to be worthless, as researchers today continue to access this collection and piece together the mysteries contained in this collection piece by piece. It's even possible to discern type specimens based on label data and Say's descriptions. These early collections laid the groundwork for what continued to be a rich history of coleopterology at the MCZ. Past curators and curatorial associates have largely focused their work on coleoptera, and our current curator, Ryan Farrell's lab, focuses on the study of coleoptera diversification. He also recently facilitated the acquisition of the David Rockefeller collection of coleoptera. 
Two of our other important beetle collections are the Leconte and Horn collections. These two were close collaborators and their collections are now stored together at the MCZ. Both made numerous trips to the Western US collecting hundreds of thousands of beetles. Together, they described 664 new genera and 6,230 new species of beetles. These two collections remain together in our cabinets as the Horn collection was acquired from the Academy of Natural Sciences in Philadelphia in the 20th century in exchange for the Scudder collection of Orthoptera and Heteroptera. We did, however, get to keep Scudder's fossils, which formed the nucleus of our absolutely stellar fossil insect collection. We have some downright incredible fossils, including this butterfly, Perdrius Persephone, from Eocene Shale from the Florissant Formation in Colorado. This specimen is catalog number one and is one of the most well-preserved fossil butterfly specimens known. The antennae and even the wing coloration is visible on this specimen. Also particularly well represented are Permian fossils from the Wellington Formation in Oklahoma and Kansas. One of the more famous fossils, Meganeuropsis americana, was described by MCZ curator and paleoentomologist Frank Morton Carpenter. This is possibly one of the largest insects that ever lived, and the type specimen is here at the MCZ. The extant relatives of Meganeuropsis are also particularly well re represented in our collections. Herman Hagen, who was the curator from 1870 to 1885, and the per first professor of entomology in the United States, assembled a massive collection of dragonflies and damselflies, which includes many important types, including these pseudostigmatids from South America. Herman Hagen also assembled a collection of what is my personal favorite collection. Uh, this is a collection of anomalies, which are specimens that have significant developmental mutations and aberrations. These specimens can be studied today to better understand the underlying mechanisms that lead to the development of certain structures and insects. And here's one of my favorites. Can you see what's wrong with it? It actually has three middle legs. And each of these specimens is accompanied by a detailed description of the defect, as you can see here. Quite possibly the most well-known collection is our ant room. Here we house over 1 million ant specimens. The coverage of the ant collection is worldwide, and there are over 7,000 primary types. This collection is the result of collecting efforts from curators William Morton Wheeler and Ed Wilson, as well as curatorial assistant Stephen Cover, who just retired this year. Ed Wilson pioneered the fields of sociobiology, and his lifetime of work is vouchered in the specimens that are deposited here. The current research of our curator, Professor Nomi Pierce, and her students links together this ant collection with the Lepidoptera collection, as their work often focuses on the relationship between these two groups. Through the work of our curators, as well as others, we also have a strong holding in Lepidoptera, with historical collections from North America, Australia, and a little bit worldwide. Um, including the collections of Sam Casino, Will Winter, and a significant portion of Vladimir Nabokov's collection of Lycenids. Our collection is still growing today. For example, just this past year, we received a collection of 18,000 moths collected locally by Mark Mello as part of his work at the Lloyd Center for the Environment in Dartmouth, Massachusetts. This collection is one of the most comprehensive collections of Massachusetts moths ever assembled. And it includes some really interesting vouchers. For example, these specimens of Noctua pronuba were the first recorded specimens from Massachusetts. Mark Mello collected them from Cape Cod in 1989. And these represent um, a new record of an introduction from Europe. Um, and these representatives are now deposited here in the MCZ. So, of course, these are only a few tiny slices of the collection at the Museum of Comparative Zoology. So, if you'd like to learn more about the collection, there's actually a few really good books written 
on our collections as a whole. There's The Rarest of the Rare by Nancy Pick and Reading the Shape of Nature by Mary P. Windsor. Um, the Ernst Meyer Library also has a reading list that you can find online with lots of articles and reports on the history of the MCZ. Or come visit us and come use the collection. Get in touch uh, for loans, photos, or visits. Um, if you need to examine a significant number of type specimens, we also have the Ernst Meyer grant for visiting researchers. So thanks so much for listening, and I'll be happy to address any questions that you might have. Thank you, Crystal. I always love seeing the uh, Abnormalies collection that you have there. Isn't that a great collection? It's so cool to have them all together as well. Are there any plans on uh, imaging some of those in 3D? Because I'm sure there will be many of us no, who would love to see them. But I could add them to the list. It's actually, it's only two drawers worth of material, so it wouldn't be that much work. Uh, we had an in, a potential intern a couple of years ago, like right before the pandemic, who wanted to work on them, and then pandemic hit, and that kind of got pushed by the wayside. So there's a question in the Q&A box. Do you have any uh, amber fossils or any fossilized ants? Oh my god, yes we do, and I should have maybe included a slide. Um, we have lots of amber fossils, um, mainly well, Dominican amber, uh, Cedar Lake amber, Baltic amber, um, a little bit of Burmese amber, um, New Jersey amber, it, it, we have a lot. Um, and we actually have almost a full cabinet of fossilized ants in amber, none of which are cataloged. Um, our entire fossil collection is cataloged and available online. They're all photographed except for the ant collection, <laughs> because that was historically kept separately, so they were not part of the digitization grant, but we'll hopefully get those digitized soon. Can you talk about the challenges of managing a collection that's both, you know, preserved previously living specimens as well as, fossil, as fossils? Yeah, it's been a steep learning curve. Um, I've trained as an ex extant biologist, um, and I knew nothing about stratigraphy. Um, I knew nothing about the preservation of fossil insects when I started. Um, so I've learned a whole lot about stratigraphy and we've worked with, it's actually really nice. We have two other departments here that are preserving fossil specimens. So there's invert paleo and vert paleo, and they have all been hugely helpful um, they are much more knowledgeable than me, and we've actually developed a little bit of a working group here um, for all of our fossil collections, and we meet once a month to talk about challenges in each of our collections. We have one last question in the chat. Are there any plans for the university to improve the physical space of the collection, specifically the temperature and humidity control? <laughs> Not in the... the near future. Um, I am pushing really hard for more space, but haven't gotten there yet. More space and better space. Um, but we're still waiting. We do what we can with what we have. And it's nice to be in a historical building. Like it gives you those warm fuzzies on the inside. But what you don't know is those warm, warm fuzzies are dermestid larvae creeping up <laughs> on you. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, we haven't had any domestic infestations, at least in the time that I've been here. Um, we had a little bit of an antibiotic problem, but we found out that those were just on packing peanuts and we got rid of the packing peanuts. And problem solved. Well, thank you very much, Crystal. You're welcome. And now we are over to Champaign, Illinois for Tommy McElrath. He's going to take us on a tour of the Illinois Natural History Survey. The Illinois Natural History Survey Insect Collection is the second oldest entomology collection in North America. We have over 3,000 primary and 13,000 secondary type specimens. Overall, we are home to over 7 million insect and other arthropod specimens. My name is Tommy McGrath. I'm the Insect Collections Manager here. Let's get started.
So one of our greatest strengths is our bee collection. So starting about this drawer right here, and then if you come backwards, follow me a little bit, this is where the bee collection ends, but everything from here all the way back, this is all the Illinois Natural History Survey bee collection. One of the reasons this collection is so big and so important is because we have all the specimens that Charles Robertson collected, who was a botanist and entomologist in Carlinville, Illinois. He collected those specimens between 1880 and 1930. And entomologists today can use that collection to compare how pollinator communities have changed over time before and after Illinois was largely converted to agriculture. Chris Dietrich and Dmitry Dmitriev, along with their students, curate our uh, tree and leafhopper collections. And these are really cool. A lot of them mimic trees, uh, tree parts like bark or thorns or things like that. So there's all kinds of cool camouflage. Um, these ones in particular, I think, are just really pretty and look like little sails. Also important, though, is that these groups are important agricultural pests. There's new species being introduced to the United States all the time, and they can not only uh, damage plants directly, but they also vector viruses and other plant diseases that can uh, hurt U.S. agriculture. And it's important that we know how to identify them using these specimens. This is our Trichoptera collection. Extends all the way back to the top left corner there. This collection has a regional focus in the Midwest, but has we have holdings th from throughout the world. Uh, these specimens have been used for a variety of different biomonitoring studies, uh, as well as uh, generating lists of threatened and endangered species for freshwater taxa, uh, especially for caddisflies and stoneflies and stuff like that. So this is a really important and awesome collection. So the Microlepidoptera collection here at the survey is really cool. This is mostly due to the contributions of Murray Glenn, who collected Microlaps near his property in Putnam County, Illinois, from the 1940s to the 1980s. These are immaculately preserved, perfectly spread micromoths. There are still new species being described from these, but unfortunately they're not digitized and they really need more work. We've talked about our pin collection a lot, but let's talk about our slides. We have about 150,000 or so slides in the collection, about half of which are due to the guy right behind me, Lou Standard. That half of the collection is all thrips. It's one of the most globally comprehensive collections of thrips in the entire world.
One of the unique and somber responsibilities we have is taking care of specimens of species that are no longer on this planet. Although one of our strengths is our extensive historic collections, it also comes with challenges, including one called vertigree. Vertigree happens when non-archival insect pins are used, and over time the pins themselves react with the air and insect insides, creating death blossoms of corroding metal. Another challenge is unique to the specimens stored in ethanol. Many of our stoppers used to prevent evaporation are reacting with the ethanol instead, and slowly melting into the vials, either destroying the specimens or causing complete evaporation. So next we have the beetle collection, which is my personal favorite. Beetles are what got me into entomology. It's what I did my PhD on. Um, and the INHS actually has the most specimens of this order compared to any of the other orders of insects and arthropods in the collection. We have extensive holdings of mostly neotropical and neartic material. However, we do have specimens from all over the world, including places like New Zealand and Kyrgyzstan and a bunch of other really cool localities. But one of the particular gems of the collection is the collection of Philophaga, this one genus of uh, scarab beetles. We have 160 drawers representing many of the species within this genus, including many primary types. And it's one of the most comprehensive collections of this genus in the world. Thanks everyone. I hope you enjoyed this short tour. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Have a great day. another amazing tour with so much production value in it as well. So I saw in the chat many comments about the really tall cabinets. Can you talk about some of the challenges that they present? Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, we actually have a bunch of like stair step ladders. It's actually not that much of a challenge, um, although you do have to pull in a ladder half the time. The actual challenge is the thrips collection, which is right behind me where I've got much less space and we don't have nearly as safe ladders. Uh, it goes all the way to the ceiling, um, which is much harder to get to. So not a lot, it's, it's kind of difficult to access a little bit, but overall it, it, it helps being tall, I'll put it that way. So there's a question in the Q and A box. In your experience, what would be the best recommendations to avoid specimen loss by vertigris or melting? So I think, I mean, honestly, it's just don't use those kind of pins in the beginning. Um, a lot of those older, it's kind of not, it's not really something we could have foreseen. I mean, back in those days, they were using whatever they could get. Um, Keep humidity down in your collection is one. Um, and we also are suffering from similar things to what the MCZ is. We're in an older building built in the 1930s. Um, we have window AC units instead of climate control. Um, and 
so we can't exactly correct that as much as we would like. Um, the melting vials is definitely unique to a particular brand of vial stoppers that was sold, and we, I think we actually know the company, but it was sold in around the 1990s. Um, and they, they had a specific mixture that's really problematic. It's not super prevalent um, in a lot of countries uh, or in a lot of uh, collections, not countries, um, because it was unique to that particular brand of stopper, as far as I know. Um, but I have heard of at least a couple different collections who also have those. Um, I tried to get a chemist involved to try to figure out exactly what was happening to see if we could stop it, but it never really went anywhere. We didn't really have any funding for the project. Um, in that case, it's, it's best to keep them cool. Um, the, we've noticed that the ones that are kept at colder temperatures more constantly don't react as much, although they do still react eventually. So uh, keeping those vials cool and also uh, uh, not, not evaporating, not, basically not evaporating helps a lot. Um, but I mean, we just kind of have to start replacing all of them. We've already done a lot of parts of the collection, um, although we haven't gotten to some of the EPTs yet, so. It's, I can imagine just the extent of the, the challenge there. Um, do you have any tips for anyone facing similar challenges, lessons learned with replacing pins or vials? Um, the vials is, is you have to get the community involved. I was lucky enough that um, my predecessor, Chris Grinter, and other people had engaged the Master Naturalist community here in Champaign-Urbana, um, which is a bunch of really awesome, dedicated, nat um, uh, usually older volunteers who help who have to maintain a certification to get a certain number of volunteer hours every year uh, in order to maintain a certification. And so they put in some of them put up to like 300 hours a year in the collection, um, helping to replace vials or do other things in the collection. So um, they've been a huge help. Um, I've also engaged the um, help of the Rotary Club here um, who don't come in nearly as much, but they have come in a few times. And there are other people who love to come in and help and know that they're contributing to saving natural heritage. Um, so uh, get a community involved. Um, beg and plead with your admin as much as possible uh, to get money for vials um, to help replace them. Um, I was thankfully able to get a couple internal grants here to start replacing um, about 30 or 40,000 of those vials, but it's, you know, a small step, one bit at a time. Well, perfect. Thank you very much, Tommy, and to everyone else in the session today. So that's going to wrap up uh, to today's uh, Collections of the World Symposium. Unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances, uh, the Central Victorian Regional Insect Collection was unable to participate today. But if you've, you're subscribed to the ECN listserv, you may have seen some of their updates about saving that collection recently. And we hope that we'll be able to share that collections with you in an upcoming, maybe future symposium, the third installment of Collections of the World, perhaps. So once again, I want to thank all of the speakers today, as well as everyone else involved in those videos. I know that the productions uh, do take a lot of time and we really appreciate getting them together. We hope that these collections of the World Tour do connect not only the collections, but the people working behind the scenes as well. Uh, so if you're interested in perhaps presenting a Collections of the World Tour in the future, please reach out to me. So. Once again, I want to thank the attendees for making this uh, session much more engaging. And that uh, wraps up the end of the program today. And I'm going to just turn it over for Chris for some final words. Thanks, Nicole. And thanks to all of our presenters and moderators again today. Another exciting ECN day two under in the books. Um, Tommy, it was great to see all the hard work you put in the INHS. It's exciting. Um, please remember to sign up for our Tricks of the Trade Symposium tomorrow. We have a few people that have put their names in there. Thank you. Don't be shy. Uh, it's going to be pretty informal and pretty fast. If you just have a cool thing that you do in your collection, we'd love to see it. Uh, please review the poster session. So our poster hall is live. We've got uh, four posters. You can view the full resolution PDFs online. You can also make comments. Um, take a look at them. Please review them before we have the poster session tomorrow. As Ainsley mentioned a few times in the chat, uh, one's on pins, it's very relevant. Uh, and also please join our meet and greets uh, this afternoon, this evening. Um, again, all of these links are on our virtual program page. And if you have any issues getting to that, let me know. Um, it should be 
pretty straightforward, but um, sometimes I move something and I break a link, so it happens occasionally. Uh, thank you, Ainsley, for posting the direct link to the poster hall. And I, we also have the business meeting slide deck up tomorrow. So if we have any slides to present, any meeting announcements, jobs, anything like that, please then send them to me. I'll get them in, included in that and archived as well. And so with that, thank you everyone for another amazing day of ECN. And we'll see you tomorrow for a meeting. Uh, and it'll be a meeting style. So please join us. Please mute if you're not actively involved in the conversation. Uh, we should have a wonderful time. Thank you. Have a great night.